This is the shocking story about a 15-year-old girl disappearance that rocks the Vatican. When a 15-year-old girl simply vanishes in one of the most bizarre cases of disappearances to ever occur in the smallest state of the world, a shadow of mystery, conspiracy, and uncertainty follows the story of the teenager who simply vanished after her music lessons. What happened to her? And why did the Vatican remain silent for almost four decades before deciding to pick up the investigative trails? Born to an average family, in the tiny papal town to hard-working parents, Emanuela Orlandi grew up in the quiet Vatican town with her loving parents and siblings, Natalina, Petro, Frederica, and Maria Cristina. For she and citizens of the Vatican, the Pope didn't only fill the role of spiritual guide, but also a protector and father figure to everyone. Her father, Erco Orlandi, worked in the Vatican Perfecture, a job that saw him set up meetings between the Pope and dignitaries who came on official visits. The 444 people who lived within the walls of the city at that time felt safe and protected. Unfortunately, a chain of events spiraled into one of the most shocking, unsolved puzzles that you and I are about to discover. Emanuela and members of her family had the honor of meeting Pope John Paul II on a number of occasions, as the clergyman never hesitated to reach out to residents of the city whenever the opportunity presented itself. On the 13th of May, 1981, during the motor procession of the Pope, four gunshots were fired by an unknown assailant, who was later identified as Mahet Agga of Turkish descent. As security details battled to save the life of the Pope, the residents of the Vatican were shaken to their core, as this assassination attempt meant the Pope had enemies lurking around. While this looked like an isolated episode, Emanuela and her family were not prepared for the dark role that would play out in shattering the peaceful home they had always known and enjoyed. Two years later, on June 22, 1983, 15-year-old Emanuela asked her brother Petro to drop her off at the music school where she spent her time learning and developing her music skills. However, Petro had reasons not to drop her off that day as he wanted to take his girlfriend to her university campus instead. The two siblings argued over this and Emanuela soon stormed off to her music school. As Petro looks back, it still hurts him to think that as the last words he had with his sister were not words of love or friendship. Later that afternoon, she called Frederica to inform her about a job opportunity from a man she met on her way to school. He offered a little over $200 to help distribute promotional materials. An exciting Emanuela couldn't wait to get out of her flute lessons that day as she made her way to her newfound employer. Her classmate, Maria Garcia, was one of the last people to see her, and she remembers Emanuela's excitement over the obvious high-paying job. She didn't join the bus home as Maria and her other colleagues left, but waited behind to begin work with the man who had promised her the job. That night, as the Orlandi family got together, it became obvious that Emanuela was missing. Her elder sister recalls the angst in the family that night as they prayed for her return while Petro, her brother, searched the streets of Rome for his little sister. By morning, Natalina goes to lay a complaint of a missing person, but surprisingly, the police authorities pay no serious attention. They allege that Emanuela might be up to some teenage prank and would return home eventually. The family's sorrow continued until the 11th day when Pope John Paul gave a moving speech appealing to the conscience of those behind the abduction. While this looked like any other speech that a leader should give on behalf of a missing person, Petro soon noticed that the Pope gave out information that they didn't know as a family. For instance, he implied that Emanuela had been abducted. Thirteen days afterward, Emanuela's abductors made their demand known. They called for the release of Mehed Aga, the man who had fired at the Pope two years earlier. They also gave an ultimatum to this request, seeking his release. As the ultimatum drew closer, they dropped off evidence that Emanuela was indeed with them. The evidence included a payment receipt from her music school, as well as a copy of her school ID. The Vatican State 
continue to hope for the safe return of the teenager, even as the Pope once again made a public appeal for her release. However, the abductors were not done, and soon they dropped off a recording of a tortured girl who had been violated by three men. The recording was carefully edited to remove the voice of the men involved. Although Petro eventually gained access to the classified recordings from the Italian secret services, some parts of the files had been redacted, and so the question remains why the security had tampered with the evidence, and who were they trying to protect? That same day, the abductors also asked to discuss the release of Emanuela on a secured phone line. However, they were not willing to speak with police, but with the Vatican instead. Giving specific phone numbers to call, they demanded to speak with a high-ranking member of the Vatican, His Eminence Agostino Carcelloi, the Vatican Secretary of State, a skilled negotiator and proficient diplomat. Unfortunately, that conversation was never made available to the public by the Vatican. It would later come to light that Carcelloi had asked all the security agents of Italy to step away from the case and allow the Vatican to handle it. This was three days to the deadline given by her abductors, and the fate of the young girl hung in the balance. The deadline soon arrived, and the shooter was not released from prison. From this point on, all forms of communication from the abductors ceased as well. All the while, Emmanuel's father continued to serve the Pope without bringing up the question of his missing daughter, as it was not ethical to bring up such a topic. The Pope also didn't give any new leads on the case, and days became weeks as weeks became months. By Christmas 1983, Emanuela had been gone for over six months. Her family had practically given up all hopes when a surprise visit from the Pope awakened their hopes once again. During his visit, he assured the family of finding and bringing back the girl, even though she was a victim of international terrorism, as he claimed. Before leaving, he offered Petro a job at the Vatican Bank. For a 23-year-old, inexperienced young man, this was too good an offer to decline, and Petro didn't hesitate to accept it. In retrospect, Petro was no longer sure if this was the Vatican's way of buying their silence. Twenty long years passed, and nothing was ever heard from the Pope. As Emmanuel's father's days came to an end in 2003, his last words were expressed in his disappointment over the betrayal of the Vatican that he had faithfully served. On February 1, 2005, Pope John Paul II would fall ill, succumb to a coma, and to death eventually on April 5, 2005. With his demise came instructions to burn all his personal documents. However, Cardinal Stanislav, his personal assistant, who he instructed to do this, defied the death wish as he considered those writings to be too important. For the next decade, Petro tried everything to gain access to the writings, but was denied over and over again. Eventually, in 2017, he was given access to the Pope John Paul II Foundation to look over some of the deceased clergyman's documents. Unfortunately, he found nothing useful there. It was obvious that Cardinal Stanislav never took those documents to the Foundation, but kept them to himself. Again, Petro tried to reach him, but never got an answer from the Cardinal. Without the possibility of help coming from the Vatican, Petro could only hope and pray that some external sources had the information needed. He didn't wait too long as a local media outlet soon came forward with some shocking angles to Emanuela's disappearance. One name rang clear, Rianotto de Pedis, a mafia boss of the Magdalena Group who had met his end after some series of assassinations on the gang. Interestingly, he'd been entombed in a place where the best of society, princes, artists, and super important people in Rome made their final resting place, and not criminals like him. It was the Saint Apollinaire Cemetery. With this shocking discovery, Petro demanded that the criminal's body be exhumed to seek for clues that might point to his sister's death. Again, he met a brick wall, because nothing was done about it for years. Soon another name with significant relevance came to the case. It was the name of Sabrina Minardi, 
the wife of the famous Larzio player, Bruno Gordi, whose love affair with none other than Renato de Pitas created quite a scandal at the time. Petro soon discovered that, unlike other mindless mob bosses, he was intelligent and good enough for use by some of the most powerful men in the Vatican. In a confession, which he eventually retrieved, she claimed that she had taken Emanuela to a place to meet with Depetis, who eventually carried the drug teenager into a waiting car with Vatican number plates. Petro came to the shocking revelation that Depetis had a special form of relationship with Archbishop Paul, the president of the Vatican Bank. For years, Petro had served with a man who either knew absolutely nothing about Emanuela's disappearance or was directly involved in the dark episode. With this revelation came more questions. Did the late Pope offer him the job at the Vatican Bank so that Archbishop Paul could watch over him and prevent him from digging into his sister's disappearance? In 2009, Petro retired from the Vatican Bank after 26 years of service. In truth, he was unceremoniously pushed out as it was clear he was inching closer to the truth. Three years later, his request to have De Petis' tomb exhumed was finally approved on May 14, 2012. Within the casket were the almost perfectly preserved remains of De Petis. It didn't take long for the face of the late Mafia boss to bear a keen resemblance to the artistic composite diagram of the police artist in 1983. The description had been given by a local traffic officer who claimed to have seen Emanuela with a man on the day of her disappearance. All the puzzles began to come together, and it became clear that Emanuela was unfortunately caught up in a money war between the Vatican and the Italian Mafia who wanted their money from the Vatican. The Vatican Bank had become the laundering point for dirty money. In some inexplicable manner, the Vatican had taken some of this money to finance some Eastern Bloc trade union policies, and the gangs wanted their money back. With the abduction of the teenager, the Vatican could spin a story. This begs the question if the assassination attempt was real or probably staged. The answers as to why the Vatican had special relationships with the Italian Mafia and why they wanted their money was exposed in 1982. When Roberto Cavalli, an Italian banker, threatened to expose the Vatican for their involvement with the Mafia. Unfortunately, he wouldn't live to make good on those threats. Twelve days later, he ended up dead, hanging by the London Bridge in a shocking and mysterious manner. It is believed that the Pope was trying to overthrow communism within the Eastern Bloc. While this is a good thing to all lovers of democracy, his funding came from dirty money. Emanuela paid the supreme price in the war to topple the Soviet Union. Although Petro's Vatican citizenship had been revoked following his marriage to an outsider, he insists that the Vatican knows more than it's telling the world about the little girl who went missing 40 years ago within its walls. He also has no plans of stopping till he gets justice for his little sister. After a Netflix release of the story featuring her disappearance, the Vatican was suddenly in a mood to investigate the mysteries surrounding her disappearance, and in June of this year, they claimed to have gathered new leads to help in solving the case. We'll add new videos when there will be updates about this shocking story. Thanks for watching. Like stories like these? Make sure you click the subscribe button before it disappears. See you in the next one.